Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, tr- those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. Okay. Oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. I'm your host, W.J. Sheehan. Hello, everybody, and thank you once again for joining us here on what is to be a stupendous podcast. My name is W.J. Sheehan, and I am the author of a series of books entitled Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters, all of which are available at Amazon. And for you audiophiles, you could also pick up volumes one through six at Audible iTunes and AC, uh, what is it? Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) And now, without any further ado, I want to welcome in my brother and co-host, Kevin Sheehan. Kevin, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great. How about you, Bill? Ah, fair to Midland. I spent the day yesterday out in the sun, uh, a little longer than I guess I should have. Boy, last night I was just like feeling it, like sun sickness or something. Oh, uh, we we had the same thing. Uh, the bride and I were out in the sun yesterday. Got a little sunburn, even though we had the sunscreen on, and I think we went to sleep at about eight thirty or nine o'clock, just wiped out. So. Yeah, I was I was bushwhacked, man. I could feel the blood vessels pulsing in my head. Yeah. Just like uh, too much heat, too quick, you know? Well, that's the thing. You're just not used to it, you know. That's it. Here but we are got- in the bo- beginning of May, the sun comes on strong, and uh, we all go out to get as much of it as we can, and then it's probably a little too much, you know. Well, you know, the whole month of April over here, talk about April showers. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, it, it seemed like 85% of the time was cloudy or rainy, and 15 was, like, partly sunny. Wow. So we just got soaked. So when you get these beautiful days, you just kind of want to go out and feel it. But it's really, it's a little too much. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyways, well, I guess. I'm glad you guys are doing okay. Yeah, we're all good. You know, and I got a couple of projects done, and that's pretty much it. Cool. But uh, how are you guys making out across the nation, our fine listeners? I hope you're all doing well. Staying COVID-free and wearing your masks. Exactly. And washing your hands. Wash and those wa- hands. Wash your hands, <laughs> you dirty boy. <laughs> so, brother, what do we have on the uh, oh. table today for our cryptids in the news and other We're oddities? going to Tennessee, the great state of Tennessee. I love Tennessee. And we're going to talk about two different things, kind of related. The Tennessee wild man. Uh huh. Have you heard of the Tennessee Wild Man? Uh, I haven't actually, but oh, he goes <laughs> well, all the I... way back to the 1800s. Uh huh. And the Flintville Monster. Holy smoke! Which... Flint Flintville is also in Tennessee. I it gather. is. It's pretty close by to where the Tennessee Wild Man has been seen. So it could be one and the same. All right. Well, I'm interested That's in hearing whatever them. we have to, to offer. Yeah, all right. So we will go to Tennessee and uh, references, you know, in the first part here, the Tennessee wild man, as I mentioned, they can be found dating back to the 1800s. And yeah, in a periodical called the Hagerstown Mail from March 5th, 1871, residents were warned about the Tennessee wild man lurking in a town called Piney, like a pine tree, only Piney, yeah. in McNary County. Jeez, so we're talking 150 years ago, this exactly. periodical. Exactly. Wow, that's and, crazy. And, uh, you know, this town uh, in this county, McNary County, I couldn't find the town. I don't know if it's still around or if it's too small to be on the map. Huh. Could be, Could be both. 
but the county is definitely there, and it's uh, east of Memphis, Tennessee, right down on the southern border of Tennessee along the edge of Mississippi and pretty close to Alabama, which is just to the east. Wow, that's some uh, gnarly country down there when it comes to uh, Bigfoot sightings. Yeah, it's pretty rural. Yeah, no so. doubt about it. And you know something? That town uh, uh, that the periodical was written about, who knows? It could have been a, a family group that lived oh, there exactly. and named it. Yeah, yeah. There's a, like I, I was searching on it, and there were some other towns like Piney Valley and Piney Hill and stuff like that, but they weren't right there in that county. So uh-huh. maybe one of our listeners will uh, write in and tell me about Piney, Tennessee. Well, there's no doubt the listeners, I can't believe, Kevin, you know, the stuff that people come in with. Oh, it's fantastic. It's really incredible, you know? Yeah. We mention something and then somebody jumps in and like, hey, by the way, uh, WJ. Yeah, uh, have you uh, heard about, you know. Freaking incredible, man. It's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and that's one of the benefits of doing what we do. The uh, knowledge base out there uh, is really vast and untapped. I mean, people are just waiting to be asked a question, and then they're like, hey, I know something about that. Exactly. Even if they never talked about it for 10 years or something like that. Well, and this is an opportunity for somebody who may be a little shy or standoffish. Yep. They could just send us an email and chime in and, uh, you know, step down or stand yeah. down. It's all anonymous, folks. We're not going to call you out unless you want us to call you out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what do we got going so on? So both over of here? these creatures, Bill, they're pretty aggressive, by the way. So uh, these aren't the shy creatures that you yes. come across. Yeah, my type of creature. Exactly, your <laughs> kind of creature. So, <laughs> so you know, as the lead in to the Tennessee wild man, they say the wild man approached women with wild, horrid screams. And uh, they were trying to, or the wild man was trying to carry off the women as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you like that? Yeah, it's creepy. And, you know, this is not the first time that uh, uh, if this is, in fact, a Bigfoot, that we've heard an association between the creature and screaming like a a murdered woman or a woman being murdered. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard so this. We'll, uh, we'll get into it a little bit more, and you'll see some commonalities, and then you'll see uh, one of the things we don't really like to see, the dreaded red glowing eyes. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> 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 but they describe uh, the wild man as having great muscular strength, covered in dark hair, and also in multiple accounts they said it ran with swiftness that defied both men and dogs. Yeah. So faster than man, men and faster than dogs. You know, I saw that one clip in Siberia. Uh, when we were discussing a while ago that whole uh, Dyatlov thing that keeps coming up. Yep. There was a clip that I saw of uh, some member of a family filming a couple of other members of the family on like a little snowy hillside with some pine trees Mm. and something ran Uh, when i tell you ran it it doesn't do it justice it was enormous and it covered a stretch of hillside between some trees basically i would say 30 yards behind them i mean pretty close well it happened so fast as everything in the foreground was very much normal. In other words, the speed wasn't different uh, how the people reacted, particularly the one boy and the way this thing moved. Right. Uh, I mean, it was wham, bam, thank you, man, ran out behind this tree and up the hill into another group of trees as fast as you could watch. Hmm. I mean, just like a blink, and I was like, what was that? But at the same time, you could tell it was enormous. This was not a little a little uh, creature. It was big. Hmm. So uh, I'm, go ahead. I'm just touching on no, that. No, no, it's cool. Yeah. Cool. 
So the descriptions about him, uh, the wild man, is he has either dark gray hair or dark ginger hair. So that's mm. kind of common with other descriptions we've seen. Yes. About seven feet tall. Uh, but here we go. Is always accompanied with piercing red eyes. Jeez. Yeah. Did they say daytime, nighttime? Uh, 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 daytime. Daytime with the glowing red eyes. Yeah, yeah. That is freaky, man. Yep. You know, and the fact the fact that you could pick out I red know. eyes in the daytime. You know, you know who knows. Yeah, very bizarre. Yeah, and then they describe him as um, letting out a disturbing war cry that could frighten anyone that hears it. And a horrible smell. So uh, he stinks, like we often uh, often hear. <laughs> yeah, he definitely stinks. <laughs> uh, Kev, uh, have you practiced the war cry at all? Or? I haven't. I got to work on the war cry. How about you? <laughs> How about? <laughs> I don't think that's it. <laughs> Wasn't it? Oh, well, you know. Maybe with a spear in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I so, got a feeling it was something a little more uh, frightening than that. Well, when you think about it, like those recordings of the the uh, howls, those could be construed as a war cry if the thing was coming after you, right? Well, look, uh, you know, if you listen to a lion uh, bellow, or a bear. I think at the time, if they're near you and they let out that thing, they're kind of giving you a little heads up. Yeah. Like, I'm not too happy You're with you being You're thinking this is here. a war cry. Yeah, yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. Wild. Fr- frightening. So, and they talk again in these accounts of the wild band's great strength, you know, and kind of a V-shaped creature, you know, kind of all muscle from the shoulders down, not much of a neck. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they they uh, have gone out hunting for them at the time, for hunting for the wild man, uh, experienced hunters. And uh, they say that they never find anything, but usually something traumatizing happens. So and they further describe this monster that over time he seems to target or have an obsession with chasing dogs and women. Huh. Yeah, and the women uh, have said, you know, down in that neck of the woods that the wild man had attempted to snatch them up and carry them away. But this, no successful attempts. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, spoken about uh, quite frequently through the years. Uh, I believe out in some of the tribal areas mm. uh, in, uh, what are we talking about, New Mexico? Right. Uh, Arizona? You know, areas out there uh, snatching women and or children. I would imagine the dogs, too, would be, uh, if they were willing to get close, would be, uh, you know, annoying at the very least if they were snapping at them and giving them away their position. Yeah, exactly. Wow, that is crazy. Exactly. So, the you know, the most recent sighting, of the wild man took place about 20 years ago near a town called Elizabeth Ten, Tennessee, which is not that far away, same general area. Mm-hmm. And a guy named Rob Phillips was there with his cousin, and they were on a night hike. So this was at night, and they're hiking through the rain near a place called Bee Cliffs, and they notice something strange in the forest. So basically, they're walking towards the cliffs in the rain. And they freeze because they say that the the mood of the forest just completely changed. So, like, they could hear a lot of things. And the quote is, it was like everything in the woods just stopped. Jeez. And this is what Phillips told the local newspaper called the Elizabeth Tin. So. And you know what? What is it? You know, it's really hard to talk about or even to put a finger on. What is it that just throws a switch? I know. It's just like weird. You know, like uh, last night, just to give in an odd little situation, I was gassing up my uh, truck uh, at a place where there's a pond across the street. 
And as soon as I got out of the truck, I could hear what I think are all of the spring frogs. Right, right, right. I mean, there must be 10,000 of them chirping away. And the noise was just, uh, once I got back in the car, even with the window shut, I could hear it. Yeah, once you stop to listen to the frogs, it's it's spectacular, the sound they make. Yeah, and that's just like, I I just think of that. And then just like, boom, nothing. Yep. And that's that's what he says. Like there was no sound at all for a period of minutes, and then all of a sudden I started to hear twigs snapping. Oh boy! Yeah, and then there was a scream like nothing they had ever heard before. They said it was not a human sound, nor an animal sound, and then we took off and they fled through the woods, and uh, then they saw the source of the scream which they described as a smelly, man-like, hairy beast at least nine feet tall with, you got it, red eyes. You mean they didn't hang around to try to gift them or say hello? They were running like cartoon characters. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, that... That sounds realistically like what would happen and what will happen. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you could go out there thinking uh, whatever you want. If that encounter happens up close and personal, you're not hanging around. Your your feet will be leaving your sneakers, and you'll be running down the hill with your girlfriend 100 yards behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he said uh, to the newspaper, he said, we knew we had experienced something. We had heard the rumors, we'd read the stories, but when it actually happened, we knew it wasn't a myth. Well, there you go. And that's the thing, Bill, right? It's like, you know, same is true for you and I. We haven't seen one of these creatures yet, and it's like, you know, the time you do, like, where was it, Whitehall, New York, where the law enforcement guy said, and then, you know, in a moment, I'm staring at something from six feet away that I've been told my whole life did not exist. Yeah. And that is the coup de grace, right? Yeah. That is the moment, the day of reckoning, where you're faced with your fears, whatever you want to call it. (laughs) There it is. And now you are left with the result of knowing this is true. And uh, how am I going to move forward from here? Yeah. It's so bizarre. I mean, it's so bizarre. I I try to put myself in that person's shoes all the time, and I understand. I would have been just like those two guys. If I was unarmed, uh, I would have been booking. No doubt. Just bolt. Whether or not you're, you're coming with me or not, man, I'm going. Yeah. Because there ain't no way. I don't care what you're lifting at the gym. That thing will <laughs> grab you up and shake you out like a paper bag. Yeah, yeah no thanks. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's unlikely, right, that the Tennessee wild man lived a uh, hundred and something years. So, you know, it's it's like likely after this sighting by uh, uh, Rob that there's another creature out there, right? And this maybe it is Bigfoot. Maybe it's an aggressive uh, group of Bigfoot here in southern Tennessee. Yeah, well, you know my stand with the glowing eyes. Uh, there's two sides to this this coin, and all of our listeners know how I feel. There is one demonic entity and one natural. Yeah. Uh, but the glowing eyes, again, what else has glowing eyeballs on this planet? Uh, self-luminescing, if you will, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know of any other creature, and if somebody does, please write in and tell me what that creature is. Yeah, let us know what we're missing out on here. Yeah. Do we know everything? Absolutely not. We're simply looking at uh, data being put forth from all areas of the planet, all time frames, throwing it out there, discussing it. And uh, we've heard this time and time again, screaming, howling, glowing eyes, fear, dread, uh, kidnapping. Uh, dead silence. The same things keep coming up over and over again. Very, very bizarre indeed. Yeah. So, so now we're going to go a little bit further east in Tennessee uh, to a place called Flintville, 
like a, a, a lighting Flint, Flintville. And um, Flintville is a little further east than McNary County, where we just were, but still down right along the southern border of the state. So uh, instead of bordering this part of the state with Mississippi, it actually borders with Alabama. And Flintville is, looks like it's just up north of Huntsville, Alabama, would be the nearest city. Okay. And time frame? Uh, we'll go. We'll go through it here. A couple of different okay. sightings. So, so this creature, um, this fits more of a true description of a Bigfoot. I think the other one did as well. Um, and according to the Augusta Chronicle, a newspaper down there, this seven foot tall monster smells like a skunk, hmm. kind of like skunk ape there, and leaves yep. footprints sixteen inches long. It's a big boy. Yeah. And one victim told the newspaper that the hairy monster screamed like an ape as it chased him through the forest. And unlike what many people think of as Bigfoot, as a gentle giant, many people, not not necessarily both of us, um, the beast seen around the town of Flintville is aggressive. Um, and farmer Ned Sinclair told the Chronicle, that thing is so big it could easily hurt somebody. Yeah, hurt. <laughs> hurt is putting it mild. Yeah, so you ask when this happened. This is pretty cool. So the first encounter with the Flintville monster occurred in 1976. So, you know, a while back, but not as far back as the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And this enormous man-like ape, jumped on the hood of a woman's car, believe it or not, breaking off the radio antenna. <laughs> it hooted wow. and sprang to the roof before it leapt off and dashed into the woods. Wow. Can you believe it? I can't. I imagine being in the car. I, you know, it's ridiculous driving down the road. You know, and this other guy said that it chased him. Now, uh, my opinion about that is it could have easily caught him had it wanted to exactly. in that moment, but it was trying to just like bug him off, if you will. Exactly, you know? exactly. I'm sure if he would have taken a stand or pushed the envelope, that thing might have got ugly quick. Yep. Wow. And they go on and they say attacks continued into the 1980s here from the Flintville Monster when the beast chased a woman into her house and banged on her door. Mm. And they say a number of attacks involved cars, including the account of a plumber and a pastor of a local church who, who reported different accounts, two different accounts, where the Bigfoot-like beast broke their vehicle antennas and bashed in their windshields. Wow. Yeah. You know, there have been some reports. Uh, I have that one we'll get into at some point in time about the school bus driver whose bus was attacked. Mm. Uh, that was kind of interesting. But uh, these these creatures don't seem to like the automobile when they're near it. No, yeah. Uh, I know uh, I have another account of some guys that were uh, their vehicle was attacked, broken down for wheeling. And another fellow whose Jeep was flipped on its side. Hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have another one, a, a group of people who were in a camper in Northern California. And as they were trying to exit hastily, this thing came up behind them and punched or smashed uh, the back of their camper. Yikes. So, you know, there's a lot of this going on. They don't they don't like uh, apparently, you know, this interference. Well, it's unnatural, know, right? Like probably the noise, the movement, everything is, you know, not natural. Yeah. I mean, do they even know what they're attacking? They're just like, probably you know, rah, you know, like a fit of rage, you know? Yeah, who knows? Remember King Kong on the Empire State, <laughs> State Building swatting, swatting at the, at the uh, airplanes? airplanes? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of, you know? Could be, could be. So, so the, the, you know, most famous attack of this Flint, Flintville monster that you'll hear about also occurred back in 1976. And get this, a mother of a four-year-old saw the tall, hairy creature running across a field toward her son, who was out playing in the field. She bolted from the house to intercept it. 
It reached its long, hairy arms towards her son, who was named Gary, and she says it came within a few inches of him. And mm. this is the account that she told police, by the way. Wow. Yeah, so she reached her son before the creature grabbed him and bolted back inside the house where she immediately called police. And she said to the police it was seven or eight feet tall and seemed to be all covered with hair. It reached out its long, hairy arms towards Gary and came within a few inches of him. Mm. Yeah. Seconds before the shaggy beast could grab the child, his terrified mother, you know, giving the account, snatched him up, darted inside the house, locked the doors. And when she got up enough courage to look out the window, she saw a big black shape covered in hair disappearing into the woods. Wow. Yeah. Boy, that was that kid's lucky day. Oh, my goodness. Could you imagine? I can't. I mean, it's just like, you know, you'd be like, your hair would be falling out, you know, <laughs> in that moment. Uh, it's just like, it's it's beyond the realm of conscious fear. Exactly. You know? How would you act? Just like, you you, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. How would you act? No, I know. Nobody's standing around there to welcome this thing in that situation. No. I was on some, I was on some Facebook uh, chat room the other day or something and at these people that say they're no kill oh yeah you know we're no yeah. kill they draw these lines we're no kill let me tell you something if you <laughs> if you were that woman and your son was about to be snatched away by this thing and you had a freaking butcher knife in your other hand guess what you'd be doing with that knife my friend yeah i mean bill like you know last summer right i was up with the uh, Huge brown bear. Some of the photos are up on our website, BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. And, you know, we were there to see them and be close with them in their environment in a setting where they didn't know humans and they didn't know human food. So, you know, really out in the bush. And, um, you know, we had our, our guide with us had bear spray. But, you know, like I've told you, he also had a, a shotgun with some good solid lead slugs in it, a pump shotgun. And, um, you know, it's like you when you're there with them. Yeah, we're no shoot. We don't want to hurt them. But if they came after you, you know, we'd be all shoot, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's time the body's could over. kill you in like one swipe. Yeah. And be on you. Oh. Lickety split. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, you know. I mean, you'd be lucky you, if you, you could get a shot off with this pump shotgun, honestly. That's they the thing, that you close, know. You know. Yep. So. Wow. So she says that minutes after she reported the incident to the police, uh, swarms of lawmen and hunters descended on our property, armed with rifles and shotguns. And they were resolved to track down and kill the creature, right? It almost took her son. Small town, yeah. USA. And throughout the night, they combed the woods on the outskirts of town. They, ne they didn't find anything. But on at least two occasions, the creature screamed at them and pelted them with rocks in the night. Wow. And this was it? at night. Yeah. And it, I mean, and oh, go ahead. All you have to do is be outside of the range of being seen with a flashlight. Of course. Yeah, that's pretty easy. And uh, ch chuck, chuck rocks at exactly. them, you know. And the thing is huge, right? Like it's yeah. you can throw some throw some rocks. Well, how about that rock ape oh, thing? Oh, yeah. Northern when California. When that tribe of rock apes was throwing rocks, the guy said there were a couple of hundred pounds. Absolutely. Whew, man. Yeah, Ape Canyon, right? And then, Ape Canyon. Yeah, and then the next day, the hunter said that they found more 16-inch footprints, as well as hair, blood, and what they said was mucus. And they said the hair was scientifically analyzed but could not be identified. Hmm. So... Freaking mucus. Yeah. Just something dripping out of its nose, uh, like a door f dog foaming at its jowls, you know. Yeah, a little uh, Labrador Retriever dripping. snarf. <laughs> 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 Flinging it around, you know. <laughs> and they said, you know, in the research I did of, of the Flintville monster, they haven't seen them since 1993. So, uh, uh, you know. Probably uh, further back into the forest. Man, and and who knows? You don't know where these things are going to surface and why. Oh, no doubt about it. Yeah. 
you know, but uh, just really bizarre, bizarre stuff. Now, uh, no mention with this one in Flintville of the red eyes. No, no. So obviously a, a demon doesn't leave uh, snot around and mucus. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just, it's no, a point right. of interest, you're you know? Right. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, this thing, uh, they got a hair sample. Yeah. Uh, mucus, what they're calling mucus. Blood and the big footprints, too. Yeah. So, you know, it's in those two accounts, we have two different things going on there, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, one and then the other, which is really perfect in, as far as I can see in that we have two examples of exactly what I, I talk about all the time. Absolutely. Very bizarre. Oh, my goodness. Cool stuff. Yeah, I'm telling you, uh, these accounts, uh, they just rattle your brain, you know, a little bit. Like, what do you say about that, you know? The assemblage of uh, lawmen and individuals with guns coming to the aid of this woman. Uh, the boy apparently on the brink of being snatched uh, in the presence of his mother. Yep. Uh, you know, and these guys are not taking this lightly. They got a vigilante group or a posse uh, right up there to try to bring some comfort to the woman and dispatch whatever was coming after her son and her, you know? Yep, no doubt about it. Wow. Boy, that is crazy. Woo! Well, you know, on our last podcast, Kev, we were talking about uh, the Oregon coast. Yep. And uh, One of my favorite places. Yeah, and then I said to you, you know, I've got a couple of uh, uh, things that uh, had occurred up in that area uh, I think there's actually two. I located one. Uh, maybe you'll be familiar with some of the areas that are talked about here. But this is a really bizarre situation. And when we talk about things such as this, it always harkens back to my saying that the Bigfoot creature is familiar with its surrounds. It knows how to get food from a variety of different resources. And you're going to see here one of the craziest things that uh, I have ever written about to date. And then, of course, it's up to everybody who's listening what they think of it. But this rather unusual sighting and evidentiary finding was brought to me by Henry Lakewood and his friend Lyle Mitchum both of them being residents of Washington State. This is uh, what they saw and found while doing a little beachcombing. So it was in June of 2011 that Lyle and I were stretching our legs on the shoreline about 20 miles south of Cape Flattery and maybe 10 miles due east of the Olympic National Park. You know that area, Kev? I do. I do. Okay. Okay. So now this is uh, Washington State, but Oregon's kind of butted up right in there as oh, well, yeah, right? just south of it. And the coastline's yeah. very similar. Like if you're out on yeah. the Olympic Peninsula looking at the Pacific Ocean, um, it looks pretty similar to, uh, you know, the northern end of Oregon, of course. Okay, so he goes on to say that you can get very close to the shore here via the highway. And we were hiking below a short bluff, which is inclusive of a protected narrow band of wildlife management zone. The time of day was about 7.30 a.m. when we began our hike. There is a large stretch of shoreline consisting of many miles which Lyle and I regularly hike at different points and different times of the year. Lyle is an artist and comes here to collect driftwood to use in sculptures. So we were hugging this bluff, scavenging through the debris from the high tide, looking for some good finds, when we were just approaching a bend in the bluff that was to our left. Once around this bend a long stretch of beach comes into view. 
which extends for many miles to the south. As soon as our eyes were clear of the bluff, we could see two large, darkly colored figures moving around a large mass laying on the shore. One of the figures was standing, and the other appeared to be down on the ground, moving around. From the distance, it looked like it may have been two men wearing coveralls or foul weather gear. So we continued on our way, which was also heading in their direction. I don't think we walked another hundred feet when the apparent guy on the ground stood up. And what we perceived as being the man who was standing turned around quickly to look in our direction. No sooner had this happened than the two of them took off, scurrying up the side of the bluff and out of sight. This whole thing was very uh, bizarre as it unfolded. And as weird as, this may also, uh, as weird as this may sound to you, picture us walking down this lonely stretch of shore and having this occur before our own eyes. We continued to walk down to where they had been. As we got closer, we could now see that the mass on the beach was in fact a dead juvenile gray whale. The whale was obviously dead and had an enormous wound on its side. To us, it appeared to be the result of what may have been a great white or perhaps a killer whale attack. It appeared to have died and washed up on the beach before being eaten. I now realized, standing over the whale, that what I was seeing from the distance was one guy holding up the upper jaw of the whale and the other guy was on the ground doing something within the mouth area of the whale. There was a lot of meat, for lack of a better word, and debris laying everywhere around the mouth of this whale on the beach. It seemed as though they had been going through the mouth to harvest the interior of the whale. As we stood there, taking this all in and trying to make some sense of it, our eyes now turned to the bluff where the figures had exited. It was fairly tall and steep, and we could see where they had climbed up it. Look, We looked it over and determined that neither of us thought we could scale it at all, let alone at a fast pace. These two guys had made it up this bluff in seconds. Moving closer to the bluff's base, our eyes were opened to what we had been seeing. There were several very large and well-made bare footprints at the base of the bluff. They were similar to a human's, but extremely large and broad in nature. The two of us, not being ignorant, now realized that we had just seen two Bigfoot scavenging a whale carcass and making a hasty exit up the bluff. With the Olympic National Park and Forest being in reasonably close proximity to our location, and the fact of the matter being that there is nothing around here to speak of to begin with, we now knew that they were in the area. The picture had now come together as to what we were seeing. I know, speaking for myself, that I was thinking, what the heck are two guys doing out here in black fishermen's rain gear? And even if they were coveralls, they would have been inappropriate for the day's conditions which were very mild. I did notice that as they started to run, their movements looked very strange. Their steps and arm swings looked disproportionate in comparison to what we are used to seeing from a human perspective. Now we knew the reason why. We had just seen two Bigfoot 
on the shore. What wow, do you think that's of that? Wild. Very, very bizarre scavenging sighting of a couple of Bigfoot creatures uh, on the shoreline, Pacific yeah, well, Northwest. And, well, you know, first off, for folks that haven't been up on the shoreline there in Washington, and I'm not talking about Puget Sound. We're talking about out on the Pacific Ocean or along the Oregon coast. I mean, it is very rural. It's spectacularly beautiful. But not many people around at all. I mean, like if you're from the Northeast, Bill, like we are, and you go out to those states, one, the first thing you're hit with is how big these states are. You know, like you look at the map and you don't realize until you stop and think about it, they're so much bigger than some of the smaller states in the east. And that coastline is just huge. And then it's, you know, so far away from another city, it's hard to get to. So even during the busy parts of the summer, you just don't see that many people, you know. Yeah, well, from the sounds of it, these two guys, you know, they had a little area there where they used to get some exercise and collect wood. Absolutely. And the driftwood there is unbelievable. You actually, you have to be careful because... You know, they have these, you know, driftwood, but it's like logs that weigh a few few thousand pounds. And then they also have this yeah. phenomenon out there on the coast. They call them sneaker waves, uh, like a sneaker. And, and what happens is you're there climbing around on these logs looking for smaller pieces of driftwood. And these waves come in, you know, that you don't see coming. And they come up higher on the beach. And, uh, of course, the power of water and flotation, they lift up these mm-hmm. logs. And the logs move, you know, at a few thousand pounds. And then they come down on you. Yeah, and people get oh killed. God. You know, you're having good, innocent fun. It's a nice, calm day. And then these sneaker waves come in and move the logs, you know. Wow. No, I know. And they have signs out there and stuff. And then, you know, you mentioned the whale maybe being attacked by a great white or or an orca. Of course. Like, man, out there, we, yeah, they got it all. All kinds of killers yeah. in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, like— uh, uh, they said both during and after the fact, kind of like, what the heck are these two guys doing? I, I would think there? the same thing, right? You, you know, so coming from you with the lack of people even visible out there, it was weird for them to even see something. No, I, I was jogging down the beach to give you a feel how rural it is. We went out as a family, I guess, three summers ago. I was jogging down the beach early in the morning in a town called Cannon Beach in Oregon. C-A-N-O-N. And it's beautiful. And it has those big haystack rock bluffs offshore, you know, that um, you Mm -hmm. see the pictures of and always the sun setting on them. And it's spectacular. But I'm out at about 7 o'clock in the morning running along these, you know, there are these hard, flat, vast beaches. And I'm coming along and I'm thinking I'm coming to like a big... uh, a uh, piece of driftwood in front of me out by the water. And I come along and I start to slow down because I'm like, wow, that's cool looking. And the thing lifts up its head and it was a huge sea lion. Yeah, wow. like nine feet long. And he must have wow. like, you know, wiped himself out the night before, you know, was having a little too much sea lion fun or something and washed up on the <laughs> beach and was sleeping it off. Yeah, and I wow. came jogging along, and he picks his head up and looks at me. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> This hello. driftwood's got a head and teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super cool. <laughs> Buzz off, yeah. big boy. Oh, so, yeah, I would have thought crazy. the same thing. You're but, coming along, like, what are these guys doing, you know? Yeah, and also interesting, huh, how uh, they said it scaled this cliff, and when they stood before it, they weren't even sure they could even no, we hear do that. it. We hear that all the time. You know, yeah. So the, the tremendous feats of agility, yeah. and uh, I don't even know if the proper term is ath- athleticism when you're talking about an animal, you know, yeah. or a beast. But uh, tremendously capable of uh, doing things that are really beyond the realm of our comprehension. Agreed. You know, absolutely agree. Wow, that's incredible. So, and how about this? They, they took note of one on the ground and one standing, thinking it's two men. But when they got there, it appeared like they were going internally through the opening 
to get into uh, some food. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's in there inside I of a whale's know. mouth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, certainly easier, I guess, than uh, going through the outside unless you have razor yeah, sharp teeth the, like a great white. blubber or whatever, you know. Maybe they yeah. don't like the blubber. Who knows? Know. Uh, maybe an easy meal, you know, if you crawl inside and <laughs> rip rip some stuff out with your six foot long arms. Yikes! Yeah, so that's that's crazy. And you know, over time, I'll, I'll dig out some of these other tales uh, because uh, it's just really bizarre. As we go along here, you're seeing coast to coast. I mean, you just left uh, uh, Alabama, Tennessee. Uh, area and here we are on the coast of the ocean coast of Washington State. Yeah, two thousand miles away, probably. Right, right. So, uh, you know, we have one with glowing red eyes. We got one non, and then we got two harvesting uh, kill uh, on yep. the beach. Wild. So, and this is not unique, folks, uh, in nature. Uh, I was on the beach fishing a couple of years ago, and a couple of uh, uh, red foxes came over the dunes. And this one little scraggly bugger that was a little bigger than a large house cat uh, starts walking down the surf line. He's looking in the surf line. And a seagull was swooping down on him, coring and whatnot, Hmm. like he didn't like him being there. They must steal their eggs. But what else was this thing doing? He was looking for probably clams, some broken up crabs. And this is a fox. Yeah, anything to eat, right? Sure. It's not it's not unusual. They know there's this potential food found yeah. there. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, a couple of Bigfoot. Maybe they're looking out over the bluff, walking along. You know, like Kevin, we, we talk about them being the ridge walkers. Yeah. Really, what would you be doing walking along a ridge to get a better yeah, you vantage get a better point, vantage point, right? absolutely. Sure. So from up there, uh, it's like a, a hawk flying over the woods. Yeah, no doubt about it. They're flying. Sure, they're looking down from a, a three or four or 500 feet, and they're looking for something moving around down below them. Mm. Absolutely. Well, wow, that's interesting. Well, so so there you have it. Uh, another awesome uh, account from the Pacific Northwest. Very cool. So what do we got today? All right, we got some uh, good listener mail, Bill. Um, We're staying in the U.S. today with these letters, but there's some good ones. So the first one is from Carol in Sacramento, California. And she says, My husband and I have camped camped and hiked in Yosemite and in, in some of the upper meadows. Sorry. And on one night, we heard what we think was a Bigfoot howl. We've been Mm. out numerous times and heard wolves and coyotes, and they can be quite frightening when you hear them. But this sounded more like the whistle on a diesel locomotive. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Watch out. You know, not a sound you're going to hear up in... uh, uh, the meadows of Yosemite, the upper meadows. Yeah, I would imagine that uh, this this sound like trumps anything else you're experiencing when you're exactly. there. You know, it's just it, it's out of place, you know, when you're like, what the heck was that? You know, it's like hearing the uh, the wolf man. Well, yeah, think of it like you were saying, you're listening to the frogs, you know, and. Stuff like that at night, and then all of a sudden you hear what sounds like a diesel train whistle, but some kind of howl, like, ooh. You know, Kev, you remember uh, when we used to live over in uh, Center Reach, uh, on certain days when you were listening, you could hear the train whistle sound down in Ron Oh, yeah, if the wind's blowing the right way, right? Right. You remember that? You'd hear... Uh, when he was when they were leaving the station, yeah. you know, and like how far away was that? What would you say, six seven miles? Yeah, I was going to say eight miles or so. You know, it's good okay. ways. Yeah, and uh, so 
the people describing this howl uh, many times as like they're just trying to pick something that they know of as being loud, like a fire siren yeah. uh, on the firehouse, you know, when uh, the noon whistle, uh, a diesel train's uh, horns. Right. You know, what we're grappling at is similar to what we're talking about when we're trying to uh, say how much did it weigh? How big right. was it? We're we're at the outer end of the spectrum of what we experience, you yep. know? Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that people say similar sure. things. Sure, you know? absolutely. Wow, that's crazy. All right. So we're going to go from Sacramento, California up to... Alaska. So this comes from Bill, not WJ, but Bill in mm. Sterling, Alaska. And I actually know where Sterling, Alaska is. And okay. he says, uh, we have some sightings up here, but I have never seen one. Do you think these creatures hibernate? What do you what do you think? Well, it's a weird thing. Uh, I personally don't. I mean, I think we'd find dens uh, if they were hibernating. Right. Uh, now, whether or not people have found dens is unknown to right. me. But I always go back to the fact that the animals around here uh, pretty much just lay on the leaves. Right. I mean, we have seen we have seen those couple of accounts, Kev, right, with the Marble Mountain yep. thing. The nest, uh, nest-like things. That, and really, it was a simple little thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Just a couple of branches to yeah, lay like down pine, on. Pine and, boughs, you know. Right. And you were still, if it was raining out, you were still going to oh, get no wet. Oh, about that it. Day. Yeah. Uh, so the point is, they have the ability to throw a little bit of stuff together, kind of like a bird making a nest. Yeah. Uh, but as far as being like a uh, true shelter. No, no. Uh I, I believe they would take advantage of uh, uh, left behind dwellings, old mining shacks, caves. Yeah. Uh, I think I think they yep. would. Uh, but those places are probably few and far between. Uh, yeah. No. And it all depends on where the locale is. Right. Right. And what's around there. Exactly. To, I mean, it's not like that, that kind of thing took place all of the places where Bigfoot are seen. So they wouldn't have wouldn't have the availability of all those mining camps and stuff like that. Yeah, Shaq. So we've heard about uh, I have that one account. Uh, I don't want to confuse it. I think it was the one I called the Ziggy Stardust, which we'll get into one mm -hmm. day. Uh, you know, I have a couple of accounts that are probably a good 30, 35 minute read. So very interesting accounts, uh, but I always kind of steer away from them when it comes to the podcast because of our own time restraints. Yeah. yeah. But maybe someday uh, we'll get into a couple of these and I'll just kind of forewarn the listeners that this is going to be a lengthy read. Because some of them are really, they're spectacular in and of themselves, but it's not, you know, it's not snap your fingers and it's right. over. Right. Uh, these are in-depth sightings going over many months with uh, numerous things occurring over the passage of time that are spoken about. So, you know, like, Kev, I was talking to Robert uh, a week or two ago. We were talking about his account for 90 yeah. minutes. You know, even if I was just to let him speak without asking him any questions, he would have been talking for over an no, hour. It's fascinating stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, there you have it. Oh, that's cool. interesting. Cool. Man. All right. And our last uh, uh, note comes in from the northeastern U.S. This comes from Jason in New Hampshire. Live free or die. <laughs> Yeah. And Jason sounds like a real outdoorsman. He says, we spend a lot of time hiking around northern New Hampshire. We see tons of moose and a lot of bear, but we've never seen a Bigfoot. Do you know of any sightings in northern New Hampshire? Wow. Huh. Well, I have that one uh, that's right on the top of my head that occurred... 
uh, over near the region of Franconia Notch. Yeah, there you go, up in the White Mountains. Yeah, but that's not really northern, no, right, no. Kev? I think of northern up up uh, north of uh, like Mount Washington, Mount Washington, right? Yeah, which is probably yeah, a good below. hour by car north of uh, Franconia Notch. Right in that region, yeah. but still within the range of the White Mountains. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I mean, one of the accounts we did, Bill, uh, was one you talked about up in uh, um, northern Vermont, which is that same you know height on the map as northern yeah. New Hampshire, right? Because they're kind of twin yeah. twin states with one another. Yeah, they're side by side. So if you drew a lawn like horizontally. Exactly. Exactly. You'd be kind of on that same uh, like you were, you line. Were, uh, the, the account, I recall, was up around like Smuggler's Notch, which is, you know, up in uh, northern northern central Vermont. So, Oh, that was the one with a couple uh, sort of beaver exactly. dams. Or the exactly. beaver lodges. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. And, you know, this is the way this is, though. It's very sporadic regionally. Where these things are seen, and who knows how many others have actually seen something and just, you know, wow, that was weird, yeah. you know, and that's the <laughs> yep. end of it. Exactly. You know, wow, honey, you're not going to believe it. I saw it today, <laughs> you know, and, and that's it, yeah. you know. And how many of them must happen, Kev? Uh, I thought, well, Thousands look, look, we, we see them, too, where the person doesn't talk about it until somebody else yeah. talks about it, even if it's yeah. years later. Yeah, you know, and I wonder about some of the emails that come in because somebody will give us a little blurb about something, two sentences, right. three sentences, right. uh, like they just want to mention it. Uh, and I've gotten back to just about everybody and said, hey, give me a call. Right. And I don't hear back. Uh, okay. Uh, some of them I do and some hmm. of them I don't. So, you know. It's what do you say about that? You know, the person took the time uh, to listen to the show, to then go to our webs uh, our website and chime in. But it was just like you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Thanks for the show. See you later. <laughs> yeah, kind of weird, you know. Who knows? But people are funny, you know. Yeah. All right, Bill. Oh, well, that's, that's it for the week. So uh, I want to thank our listeners for all the great reviews. And if you can right now while you're listening and it's fresh in your mind, you know, open up your favorite podcast player and give us five stars. It's really important to give us five stars because it brings more listeners to the podcast. And when we have more listeners, we're able to produce a higher quality podcast to all of you. So we thank you for all your support. Go on, go on over there and give us five stars. And uh, uh, we hope that all of you are still set, staying safe as uh, hopefully we head towards uh, the downslope of this uh, horrible COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, it's uh, pretty freaky. I don't know, you know, personally where this is going to end, but uh, I'm hoping and praying for the best. Let's leave it at yeah. that, you know. Yeah. Uh, be safe, wear your mask, do your social distancing, irregardless of what the pineapple next to you is doing. <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get out of this uh, okay, right. you know. Uh, and in the meantime, if you should be out and about, social distancing walking in the woods alone remember always carry more gun than you think you're gonna need sleep tight <laughs> <laughs>